Welcome to the Equestrian Perspective Podcast. I'm Felicity Davies and I'm here to simplify horse training and teach you absolutely everything you need to know about how to build both your own and your horse's confidence levels, form an amazing relationship together and feel empowered in any environment. And on this podcast, I'll be sharing my best advice, trainings and mindset shifts so you can truly connect with your horse and pursue your goals in a way that feels good for both of you. So get ready to embark on a new equestrian perspective and I'll see you on the other side. Welcome back to the Equestrian Perspective podcast and today I'm super excited to welcome a guest I've only recently just started following on social media but I found one of her posts and it really captured me Um, And I was just super intrigued to hear more about her. But today I'm chatting with Celeste Leilani. Leilani, is that how you say it? (laughs) Yeah, good job. (laughs) Celeste Leilani Lazarus. Um, And she describes herself as the traveling horse witch and she heals horses and humans through bodywork, mindset and breathwork. So Celeste, can you please give us um, a bit more of a deeper introduction into who you are, where you're from and what you do? Yeah, most definitely. Um, Well, originally I'm from Hawaii. Uh, That's the Leilani name. And so I was born and raised there and it was pretty cool because in Hawaii, everything is, I think there's a lot of culture there and just a lot of really deep reverence and respect for the land and for animals and horses. And my mom was actually Native American based too growing up. And so we just, everything for us is really about relationship with the horse. Yeah. And so that was kind of just my initial start. Um, but would you, do you want me to start all the way back as when, as a kid or kind of what I do now or. Yeah. Let's just start with just giving people a nutshell of what you do now, because I know that you're very much into the bodywork side of things, but you've got lots of different kind of areas going on. I know that they all kind of work together. So you're based For in the U S. Sure. Um, I am based in the U S. Yeah. What I live work... in. You go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I live in Washington state now and I do primarily anymore. I do mostly body work on horses and horse training. Um, and when we do horse training, it's more like rehabilitation based is more of how I explain it now. And it's not so much rehabilitation from injuries though we do do that, but it's more kind of rehabbing the mind and reprogramming the body and how it should work on its own and trying to find its own balance and fitness through movement, um, through correct movement. Um, the breathwork portion of it is really, you know, teaching both horses and riders how to breathe. I don't know about you, but one of the things that's really common is holding your breath, Yeah. especially like I I was in the jumpers for a while, you know, you get out there and the adrenaline's going and you're trying to like, think of, you know, horseback riding's the ultimate dexterity contest. And so we're just constantly thinking of all these different things. And then we forget to breathe (laughs) and then our horses also forget to breathe. And so really kind of teaching people to connect to their breath and then to their horse. And then the same back and forth is really pivotal in it as well. Yeah. So I do train, um, a fair bit with the competition teams. So I do a lot of like the hunter jumper teams and the dressage rider team. So I get to work on the rider physically. So I'll do body work on the rider and then I can do body work on the horses and then sync them up together through exercise and breath work to kind of really help them work through the holdings that I find when I'm working on them and then how to strengthen and build on top of that. So they're both more in sync and then they're just honestly more able to move together more freely. Yeah. Very cool. Ah, that's so cool. And um, yeah, I'm excited to later on in this podcast, I'll hold myself back, just dive more into that because I'm sure that you would see some like um, a lot of like mirroring going on between the horses and the riders and them sort of carrying tension for one another and all of that. So that's just my assumption so just hearing that. Um, so much. <laughs> we can dive into that later, which is very cool. So uh, let's just start, let's just roll way back. How old were you when you got into horses? Well, um, my mom was always into horses and it, honestly, as far back as I remember, the running joke is that I ride much better than I walk. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> and so my mom, let's see, definitely started riding before I could really walk much. Um, I started formal lessons when I was eight, but when I was five, you would often catch me out in a pasture or getting on any horse I can possibly find. My grandfather over here in Washington, we would come visit in the summers and he had 
broke he well they were broke to drive a cart but they were not broke under saddle which are two very different things <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. and um you would off you would often find me sneaking out trying to ride them bareback and often getting fucked off but yeah. it was like I was just I was just committed to it and so my mom was like well obviously she really wants it she doesn't care when she falls off she's just going to keep getting back on and trying so let's get her into some formal lessons and so I began formal writing lessons um English writing lessons at the age of eight mm-hmm. and I really just rode mostly English throughout my childhood, English and jumping. My mom really wanted me to have a solid foundation in that before really having me kind of transfer over into anything else. And Mm -hmm. it was just wonderful. Um, I got in with several really good dressage trainers and some good jumper trainers. And um, most of them had a lot of, you know, very similar perspectives of just understanding that the old school foundational classical dressage was really the best. I guess, foundation for anything that you want to do. You know, if you can learn how to sync up your horse and ride in a balanced way, you can take that and do barrels if you want to, or you can do anything that you want. So Mm -hmm. really went through that. But jumping was always honestly my favorite, but I was always intrigued, um, especially when I was growing up, there was always a really, I guess there still kind of is not as much so, but there was always a very big divide Mm -hmm. in English and Western people. I don't know if it's like that in Australia too, but over here. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's like this huge, it's just like this huge cultural difference. And I was always kind of intrigued by that and to try to figure out like, why is it so different? Because some a lot of the trainers that I grew up with were like, I mean, we just don't associate with those Western people. <laughs> like, yeah, it's very sure. super different. Um, and I could never quite figure that out because I was your just really avid horse lover. And I was really obsessed with learning literally any type of writing and schooling and discipline you could possibly do so like now flash forward all these years later I've competed in jumpers and dressage a little bit of venting I've done mounted shooting the only, I haven't done mounted archery yet but I really want to do that um can drive carts barrel racing western pleasure raining like wow I've kind of <laughs> dabbled in a little bit of everything <laughs> yeah um just because I've always been like and to me it all feels the same when you're doing it correctly yep So that was, that was more so like how I was growing up. I was just always just like hell bent on trying to be able to do all of it, just to play with it and be able to get on your horse and just be like, all right, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. No, that's super cool. And you would see, like you said, the foundation of doing all of those very well is very much grounded into that like classical dressage type training Mm -hmm. and really, really honing in on your foundation and getting that super solid before you add any advanced movement. Whereas a lot of people focus way too much on the sort of more advanced side of things and then yeah. run into problems which you probably encounter all the time in the, the yes. work that you do. Um, okay, awesome. So you sort of d- dove into all different kinds of disciplines and things like that. So how long were you doing that for? Like what sort of span of, so you started, what what was it? You started lessons when you were eight, is that right? Yep, I was eight. Um and so I want to say I rode mostly English from eight to about 17. I think I got to do a little bit of some Western pleasure shows in between there. Um, I got hired from some people as a teenager just to kind of help them with their horses. They had some quarter uh-huh. horses. And then, and I really wasn't allowed to play in, with barrel racing or anything like that. Genuinely, like I wasn't allowed to really tamper into the Western side of things until I was older. And when I was 18, I moved over to Washington state from Hawaii uh-huh. and started dating a cowboy, honestly. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was, it was quite funny because I had my, my horse that I'd been doing a lot of, you know, English competition with, and, you know, you write, you know, the English writers, we write, you know, quote unquote, pretty. Mm-hmm. And I remember dating this cowboy and he was like, oh, well, you know, you and your pretty riders and the pretty horses, like they can't hold up in the cow sorting pen or they couldn't sort up in these gaming days. And I was like, well, yeah, we could like, yeah, I can like, ride. like, of course I could do it, you know? Yeah. And so it kind of started out as a joke of him basically saying there's no way that I could hang with the group. And so I would show up with my, he was, well, I still, I still have him actually, he's 19, but he is an Anglo Arab big gray very typey neck head flashy movement you know and I'm out there posting and writing quote unquote pretty but we showed up at this cattle sorting thing and I was like so what do we do and he's like this is just embarrassing like there's no way you're gonna I'm like no seriously like I want to do this what are we doing (laughs) and 
he's like, well, you know, we pick a cow and then we have to chase the cow from this end to the other end. And I'm like, all right, cool. Like we can figure this out. And the first like few minutes, my horse was not quite entirely sure what to think about the whole thing, but he was always very brave again, because we always did a lot of groundwork and all kinds of different things. So, you know, he was game. Yeah. And before you knew it, he figured out that the cow would run from him and it was like game over. So my fancy dressage jumper horse was like, just having the time of his life chasing cows. He just thought it was the coolest thing he'd ever experienced. <laughs> and so we're just having a blast. And all the cowboys thought I was really funny. And my horse was quite fast. And so we did really well. And then a couple of weeks later, I took him to this gaming event. And same thing, right? Like I've, I'd never run a course. I'd never run any kind of pattern before, but we'd done jumping. And so we know how to go fast and turn tight. Yeah. So I'm like, it's the same thing. I just go around the things instead of over it. Really? Like, yeah it should be fine. And same thing, you know, they're just talking crap and there's no way, blah, blah, blah. Because I don't, and again, I don't know how it is over there, but over here, like in the gaming industry, you know, you got some pretty crazy people that go running in there and they're, you know, they're just cramming on the horse's face and their mouths are wide open. And it's like everything that they can do to just, I mean, I hand it to the riders. Like, I don't know how they stay on half the time if we're being honest. I mean, they're just like, yeah, legs are flapping to the wall. Yeah. 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 There's like no control, but man, they stick it and the horse gets it back and somehow, you know, they do well. And that's certainly not how I ride, but I was like, all right, well, we'll give it a shot. And again, you know, I go in. So if you can just kind of imagine we're in this, you know, this barrel race and I go in and I do my little like circle before you let the horse run. And it's just this really pretty little canter (laughs) (laughs) where collected (laughs) and I get him down to the end and I, turned him and my horse really responds like his go fast signal is to whistle and so I got him lined up I got him super straight so he had a really good shot and I whistled and he just took off and we ended up getting an arena record our first time out Wow! (laughs) and that was like my big you know just kind of slapped in the face to my boyfriend at the time because I was like he's fine like he's super fast who's a you know he's half thoroughbred and his uh, grandfather was quite a racehorse And so I was like, it's all the same thing. You know, if you know how to ride and you're synced with your horse, it's fine. And so it kind of, my whole life, it's almost been like how I won bets. Mm. (laughs) So, um, yeah, I think that was really the majority of how it kind of started. And then I just fell in love with it. And because I could cross over well into both things and my horse genuinely enjoyed both. I know not all horses genuinely enjoy both things, but he really did. And so it was just always fun to kind of play with it and then I think I got to educate a lot of people too because they would ask they're like well why is your horse so calm and like yeah he's never had an injury his entire life he's been completely sound we had a bout of a neurological case that he ended up getting over here but it was never in soundness that he had from yeah from incorrect writing or anything and lord knows I've made so many mistakes on this horse mind you I've had him since he was two I'm sure that he is the sum of all of my mistakes yeah um but I've always tried to really be mindful of making sure that he was actually fit for the job that I wanted him to do and that he understood the job and that he was balanced for it. And that's been really all of his and mine success. And so even though I didn't know it at the time, that's really been like the foundational principles that I've always kind of had, even if it was just me being, you know, snarky and trying to win bets with people, it really was, I really think there's a better way of doing this. If we kind of just dig a little bit deeper, Mm -hmm. it's all these years later, it's this, so it's the same foundation that I'm doing. Yeah, for sure. So it sounds like you very much had a, a real intuitive way of like, I guess you had a really good grounding from the instructors and things like that when you were younger with the classical dressage and then you just put your own sort of foundation on it. And I guess when you have a upbringing like that or something just clicks and makes sense and you're like, this is obvious, duh, like, why isn't everyone doing this? And then you realize, (laughs) oh, everyone isn't doing this because they haven't been taught this and they don't know any different. Um, And then it's like mind blowing to other people. Um, So yeah, that's, that's super interesting. So in regards to you, so do you compete now or you just focus on like the work that you're doing or where are you at right now? I have not been competing. I'm actually a mom now. Not that that means that you can't compete, but I actually stopped competing shortly after becoming a mom. I have two young boys. um, Cool. And it's just really hard kind of being on the road and traveling. So about 
see, my youngest is about to be seven. And so that was about when I stopped when I had him was when I kind of closed shop on my I had Uh a really nice training business that I was doing for a long time, right? taught writers and it was, you know, I had a lot of students that would go out and compete in different disciplines and win. And Mm -hmm. it was really fun, but it was also really hectic. Um, I'm sure like if you've done the competition thing, you know, and I had, and even when I taught, I taught different disciplines too. So I had some that were going off to barrel races one weekend, and then I had others that were wanting to go to the jumpers and then Mm -hmm. dressage. And it's really hard. I really like being a hands-on trainer and I really like to go to the competitions with my students and, you know, and support them and coach them and help them out. And it got really hectic trying to manage all of the different ones versus just one, you know, having like one barn where they all go to the exact same thing every time. For sure. And that was something that kind of kicked me in, that kind of bit me in the butt doing that way. But I've, you know, again, like it's not really how I'm wired because I couldn't figure out like, it's not that I couldn't figure it out, but I didn't ever like putting myself in a box of, oh, I'm just a, I'm just a jumper trainer, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Cause you're like, um, it goes with everything. <laughs> it's everything. Yeah. And so, but it, but it did, it did schedule wise bite me in the butt. And then the other reason for kind of closing shop too, is that I honestly was getting burnt out on it. Um, mm-hmm. And I, and I loved competing too. I love the, especially anything speeds so like barrels and jumping totally love that because it's so I mean, it's who's ever clean, fastest clean wins, right? Like there's yeah. no bias, there's no politics, there's no who who had the more expensive horse or if the judge just particularly liked graze that day. I mean, it's just really, you go out yeah. and you're either good enough or you're not. Yeah. And so I have always genuinely loved those, but I like, I like any kind of competition as long as it's, you know, a good time and a fun, but there was always another piece of me. And this is, I guess how, you know, it kind of transfers into the body work thing that I was mm-hmm. like. I felt like I had to apologize to the horses a lot, like way more than I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And I found that a lot of the times when I would have to give a lesson, you know, it's like, you know, the writer's really trying their best to understand them. And I'm trying my best to try to communicate and to piece them together. And, you know, there would be something going on and I could always feel, and it really just goes down to that intuition, right? Like it's, Mm -hmm. my horses were always sound. There were never, like, there was never any hot, obvious like heat or swelling there was never they weren't limping like it wasn't like they were unsound and so I you couldn't really be like oh well they're hurting but there was something that was not really correct about what was going on with them and I could just I just felt like I was apologizing to him all the time and I didn't know what it was Mm. so between that and the schedule by the time I had my youngest son I just really just closed shop and I was like I really don't want to be doing yeah I, I I can't imagine a life without horses but I can't do this version of it oh. anymore yeah um and shortly before that I had gotten introduced to equine massage mm-hmm. which I will start <laughs> this by saying and it's and people don't believe me when I say it and I really I, I was really actually it's not that I was against it I just didn't believe in it at all whatsoever I was actually quite the skeptic yeah um I had never gotten body work done even on myself before. And so, and our horses never had growing up. And I got the privilege of working with people that were, you know, hand in hand with Olympic coaches, like very, very, very top names. None of these people had body work done on their horses. And it wasn't, it just wasn't a thing growing up. And so this lady comes out to the barn and she's doing equine massage. And I was like, I mean, yeah, that's really cool. Like I'm sure the horses like getting their butts rubbed, but you know, like, it's, yeah, I don't know. I, I was just not very... Yeah, I guess supportive about the whole thing. And she kind of made a comment about one of the horses that had come in for training that had a lot of behavioral issues. And that was always my specialist is I always got I still do to this day, I always end up with the horses that like nobody can quite figure out like the reject cases. Yeah. And so she was watching him one day, she was just like, you should let me work on him. And, you know, I mean, I'm not a jerk, but I was just like, well, I mean, he's he's in here for behavior issues, like he's he's having behavior mm-hmm. problems like getting a massage isn't going to do anything for him mm-hmm. and she's like well let's just give it a shot you know I won't I won't charge you anything like let's just look at him and take a look and I'm like all right fine you know whatever give it a shot and she worked on him and probably I would say 60 to 70 percent of the problems that he came in with went away yeah and I sat there and I was like huh like okay <laughs> yeah. so, I messed with her, you know, I talked to her for a little while. And then the next time she came out, I gave her another one to work on. And it was a very similar thing. 
And I got to see the freedom and the expression and the freedom of the movement of the horse. And I was like, oh, like, this is really a thing. And it started clicking that what I was picking up on with them was really was that discomfort. And again, it's not your obvious. Yeah, I was also a vet tech for a while. So like, it's not so I really know how to like hunt for the lameness. And Mm -hmm. it wasn't anything that we were taught for. And so it was really interesting. Thing and I still couldn't quite figure it out, but I knew it was real. Like, I mean, the results spoke for themselves and my horses were immediately happier and more comfortable. And the mm-hmm. owners were like, Oh my God, like you're just, you're, you've come so far with them. And it really made me look good as the trainer. And I, <laughs> like I didn't really do anything. <laughs> um, so it was really neat. So I really kind of started implementing that. So that seed had been planted by the time I decided to shut down my training business and just kind of focus on being a mom for a little while. And then while I was doing that, I just really dove into the body work thing. And I was like, I really think that this is what I want to do for a while. Um, It's a lot harder. It was a lot harder in the beginning, for sure, to make money at it, because it's just such a different thing. And then, Mm. you know, getting the clientele was, I suppose, a little bit easier, because I already had a name for myself. And so I kind of got to go like fresh out of school, hit the ground running, people knew who I was. So they trusted that I would at least try. Um, But yeah, it really, I was like, I really want to spend the next however many years of my life basically, I don't know, going back and apologizing to the horses for all of the times that like I trained them. And I, you know, and I did that. I was like the bungee queen. I I geared my horses up. We did mm. gimmicks and different bits. I have <laughs> Tupperwares of bits in my garage that I'm just quite frankly embarrassed about that I have, but it's yeah. true. And I keep them so I can show people like I'm not, yeah. I'm really not that typical you know, you meet people, a lot of people that are like super intuitive about the horses and they, mm. they, we have a lot of the same message, but they've like always been like that. Yeah. Um, I wasn't, Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. intuitive and I knew I understood balance and fitness. And I always tried to have a lot of a mindful horsemanship about it. And I schooled very classically and very competitively. And we absolutely used the more force, more gear, more, you know, like, yeah. so I do understand both sides of it. Um, and I think that's what, really kind of kicked me in the butt after the fact, because I was like, holy crap, like this time that I had, you know, really felt like I just had to keep upping the bit on this horse that was blowing through Mm -hmm. me. He was just in chronic pain or he had no idea how to balance. That's why he was heavy. And, you know, you start my, my, my brain spins like a thousand rabbit trails. Um, and I could sit there and just think about, you know, every day I would think of some other horse or some other case. And I have computer files of all these different, I always kept a file on every horse I ever had in training and I'd go back and read the notes. And I was like, Oh my gosh, like yeah. <laughs> just basically using him as case studies. And, you know, we can't do much about going back and fixing the past, unfortunately, but it's definitely given me a lot of conviction, I suppose, moving forward to really make sure that I try to do right by them. And so everything that I do now is like, I can bring it. I have something to pull from very, very rarely anymore. Do I come across a case of either behavior or movement or something like that, that that I can't go back in my Rolodex of files and my brain of horses that I worked with and be like, Oh no, I totally remember this. Like, this is this thing that came up and then this is what we did for it. That didn't work. Let's do this instead. Yeah. And it's just, it's been really really cool um so it's been a long journey of it for sure but it's something that I just am obsessed with at this point yeah and yeah yeah, so that's that's just all I do now and I so I just did body work for horses for a very long time and then I found and it's did you read the thing about the mirroring the horses mirroring riders yeah I was going to actually read that out loud because I thought I don't know whether I'll read the whole thing or you could even just give it a summary of it. Totally up to you. <laughs> it's pretty long. Um, but yeah, maybe no, we'll I'll post ju- a link. We'll post the link in the comments. <laughs> I'll post the link in the comments, but basically I'll just let me, I'll read a bit of it and then you can go on your, your, you can sort of lead off from there. But before we do that, I just want to um, tie in some key points for those that are listening um, in regards to you chatting about the body work with the horses because it really sounds like um, you mentioned that you always felt like something was sort of like what you were doing was fine but it didn't feel 100% 
And then Mm -hmm. like that's when you pivoted out of the sort of competition kind of realm. Um, And interestingly, uh, I did a podcast last week with a uh, equine assisted therapist and she was talking about with her clients um, what she would do is she'll get them to do a body scan. So just do a meditation, scan their body and pick up any energy that they're holding or tension that they're holding in their body, not to shift it, but just become aware of it. And then Mm -hmm. get them to do the same thing in front of, the horse so then basically if something else arises when they're with the horse that might be the horse's energy sort of showing up in their body so maybe like you were just in through your body or whatever your sense of like perception in that regard you were just picking up that hair something's not quite right going back to that intuition point of view yeah um, which is why like the the, it's so different when you see like a horse before or after they've had the body work, whether you've done it or someone that you respect has done as well. Um, so, yeah, I just thought that was really interesting. And it just every time I keep speaking to someone, it always ties back to like trust your gut, like to those that are listening, yep. like seriously, if something doesn't feel right, like there's a reason, like you've got to listen. Always. Yeah. Every time. Yep. Okay, cool. Now we can pivot into (laughs) the (laughs) human side of things. So basically, Celeste wrote an amazing post and one of my students actually shared it. And I was like, Amy, you need to tag me in this. What is this? And she tagged me in it. And then I pretty much contacted Celeste straight away. So and starts like this. So I'll just read a little bit and then you can kind of pivot into what you want to expand on it. So Um, You've got horses have more mirror neurons than most any other creature. It's what enables them to read human emotion and be able to hold space in therapy sessions. It's what keeps them alive in the wild. It's what makes them create the same holdings that their riders do. It's what causes them to behave differently based off of their handlers. In the same breath, it's also what we do as riders to help them come back to their center in a more natural and kind way. Okay, over to you. (laughs) (laughs) it's it's so funny because I had absolutely no idea like I've written some really cool pieces or what things that I thought were really influential and there was nothing inside of me that thought that that was going to be the one that got as viral as it did and I was <laughs> so funny I, I, it's still like I saw it again it's just people are every day are sharing and I'm like ah, oh, this is just bananas it's yeah. really cool though um and it's been neat because it's actually opened up a lot of discussion around things so there's there's actually still some debate about whether or not mirror neurons are even a thing, or, which I think is really quite funny because I feel like horses are very obvious that they are. Um, oh, they totally are. Definitely. Um, the the woman who I was just speaking about, the equine assisted therapist, Louise, um, she works for Tara Swart and Tara is mm-hmm. a neuroscientist and um, yes. connects, <laughs> connects spirituality with neuroscience and she's got a yes. book called The Source and she talks about mirror neurons and all that stuff. So and I know that you, I was going to mention this before because you were talking about your career journey and you. I noticed on your website, you've got a degree in science with animal science and mm-hmm. uh, psychology. So I don't know mm-hmm. when that happened. Did that happen before the body work? <laughs> it, it did. It did actually. <laughs> what was yeah, the I aim feel- behind that initially? Uh, the aim behind that was I've just always genuinely been interested in psychology and cool. humans and the way yeah. that they behave. I was actually a foster kid growing up. Um, and uh-huh. so I have just kind of always, I have a lot, I was, there's a lot of background to my life and story, but I've just always genuinely been curious about what makes people tick the way that they do. Yep. And so I did a double um, major in college and my original attempt actually or intent, not attempt. My original intent was I was going to be a vet. Yeah. And so I went through to get my bachelor's of science to go to vet school and I, I got accepted into OSU and I was just going to go and do that. And then I just honestly just something, and it goes back, I guess, to that intuition thing that I was just like, no, nope, that's not it. Like, like you do want it, like you do want to make a difference. You do want to heal the horses, but like, that's not quite what you want to do yet. And so I pulled mm-hmm. back and just kind of went and that's when I opened my training business and I was like well we're just going to do this for you know the next 10 years or so yeah and so it really is interesting being I mean I'm not old but I'm 34 and I'm at 34 with my kids kind of looking back as a kid and it's really funny I've been doing this while we're talking and I'm like you know everything that I did and everything that I was interested in even though I didn't know it at the time led me to what I'm doing now and it all kind of pieced it together yeah, looking and back, just, you can connect all the dots and you're like, ah, oh, yeah. makes sense. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's super trippy. And so that's, that's where all that comes from. And the psychology definitely kicks in often. And I'm an avid book reader. So anything that I can get my hands on, I've always been obsessed with neuropsychology. And um, yeah, but when one of those posts got shared in a group called correct, correct dressage studies, I believe, or correct dressage. Oh, yeah. Something. I'm not sure if you're in that one or not. And it's so funny, because like, man, there were some people that just like attacked the hell out of the whole mirror neuron thing. And I sat there and I'm not one to like, I mean, if you have a difference in opinions, that's fine. Like you're totally entitled to it. But another girl that I am just extremely inspired by, her name is Tara Davis. If you guys don't follow her on Instagram, she's, I think it's Unbridled Goddess is her. Oh, yeah. 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 She's amazing. Right. Like she does all of the dancing with the, she does the Liberty stuff with the horses and she's just really cool. And so her and I have connected a little and anyway, she commented on it and she was dropping all of these big links that are like from Harvard and, you know, some really big places stating Mm -hmm. how that it's a real thing. Like this isn't really even up for debate and I'm sorry that you think that way, but it's really true. And so, and again, again, going back to, you know, everybody's entitled to their opinion. To me, it's so even like, it's wonderful having all the evidence, Mm. but it's like, you don't even need to have that. If you've ever experienced it with a horse, like you understand, you know, there's no, there's like nothing inside of me at all that could even possibly argue that that exists. Yeah. So that's really cool. Um, and it does like, it's, I have a girlfriend here that runs a ranch and she also does the equine assisted therapy and Mm -hmm. it's just beautiful to watch and it's beautiful how they interact with people and the things that it brings up and the way that they help people. And so I've always, I've always done that. And again, going back to when I was a kid, when I was a foster kid, the main ranch that I got, I just got really lucky and I got to work with a ranch and they, um, they would bring in specifically, they would bring in abused rescues and they would team up the each foster kid would have their own abused rescue horse that they would work with. Mm. And at the time it wasn't called equine assisted therapy, but I'm pretty sure that's what they were going for. Um, and, and it got, you know, they ran a nonprofit for the abused and for the rescue horses too, so that they actually had somebody that was working with them. And we were all, you know, at least a little educated in horses. They weren't just throwing random kids in with random horses. Like we did have horse experience, but you know, I got to have my horse training journey started as a kid because I would get teamed up with these horses that, you know, they hated humans or they were terrified of them. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you would just sit in a round pen with them for an hour, two hours and just breathe. And maybe sometimes that was just enough for them. And you, you know, I would move certain ways and I would watch them mimic my patterns eventually. And, you know, or the same vice versa. And so I understood that concept of the mirroring at a very young age without understanding that that's what it was. Yeah. And so that's always how I've been, able to ride and that was one of the things I'd figured out where it was like oh this is what made me so good like I could get on it was almost like a cheap party trick like I could get on anybody's horse and I could all of a sudden get them to breathe and they're like oh they never breathe they never bring their nose down they never do these things but like I could get on the horse and within like five minutes I would you know they're breathing and they're stretching out and they're super happy and they're like oh it's just this like she just you know does magic on these horses and so the whole like (laughs) the magic and like the traveling horse, which like, they're just nicknames that people have given me over the years that I just always sound funny. Um, and it's because of stuff like this. And I just could never figure out, I'm like, what the hell am I doing? That's so different. Like, and I never felt like I was super special. Like I didn't think I was getting on there, like sprinkling pixie dust on them. It just yeah. <laughs> like, I would just get on and, and then, and then ride and then r- ride how I just kind of did growing up but then I'm you know I I started getting into reading and researching different things and um in that article I mentioned a girl named Catherine Calkins and she's just she's one of my biggest inspirations honestly she's absolutely brilliant and she understands she's a biomechanic master out of Arizona um and she just really understands the fundamentals of what makes the horses and the riders do what they do and she understands the mirror neurons and I remember she was talking to me about it one time and I was like holy shit like that's it like that's that's what it is like we actually like you know you know like when you know something and all of a sudden like somebody tells you what it's called you're like (gasps) (laughs) finally my life makes sense (laughs) can you just explain for a second just to those listening that don't know what mirror neurons are can you just briefly explain that 
I feel like I'm not going to do it justice, but I will really try. So my under my core understanding of the mirror neurons is that there's something that most most animals have them like humans have them too. Um, but prey animals specifically, so horses have more of them. So it's really what helps them respond to things. So imagine, imagine just having like a bunch of little mirrors floating around in your body. And so it picks up on what its environment is doing. So then it can kind of reflect it back to their brain to tell them very quickly that, you know, in order to be safe, you need to respond to this thing. Mm -hmm. And typically the way to be safest is to respond, to make yourself blend in. You find this a lot with people that are autistic is that they have a lot of mirror neurons as well. So they'll pick up, you know, the expressions and the, you know, what's going on around them. And then they can kind of try to basically fake it, even if they don't know what it is. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, And so with horses, you know, you can go into an environment. So like one of my favorite, and this was one of the things that was trippy when I really started learning about it is I was doing a, well, we were doing a whole bunch of different groundwork lessons, but there was one particular one where Catherine had somebody in a round pen and it's a very big round pen. So the horse had some movement. I think it was like a 60. And so the horse is going around and they were just, the person was right or like doing stuff in hand. So not quite lunging, but just working with the horse and the horse couldn't pick up its left lead, just could Mm -hmm. not pick up its left lead to save its life. And, you know, later to find out that it did need some body stuff and there were some things going on. And so we were able to address it, but before doing all of that, so the horse is still struggling through whatever physical limitations it has before doing any of that, she's going in a circle and she's having the handler like work a certain way. So the the handler circling around the middle of the horse and the horse is going around the outside. And then she just kind of starts asking the handler to extend her, you know, her left leg a little bit more and almost to mimic, not like out there actually like trying to gallop, but just kind of mimicking her motion, rocking from her right hip into her left leg and just kind of striding. So she does that like a few times. And then all of a sudden she asked the horse to canter again and the horse rocked back and he picked up his left canter. Hmm. And I was like, that's a fluke. (laughs) <laughs> no way. you know and even and even the handler said that she was just like oh you know he probably just got tired she's like okay well you know try it again go back to how you're doing it the other way so she stopped being intentional with her body mm-hmm. and she just asked the horse to pick up the can and the, cor- the horse goes straight to the right canner right because that mm-hmm. was the easy one so she goes back again and we try it again same thing she altered her body and the way that she carried it and yeah. picked it up. And then that's what happened. And then Catherine is explaining, she's like, this is how a lot of Liberty trainers, you know, the really good ones figure this out. And yeah. that's, that's kind of what happens. And then I was asking, I said, so is that what happens? You know, when we transfer things to under saddle, because I understand, I understand biomechanics very well, especially since, so I've gone to school for both horses and humans. Like I know the ins and outs of both of those bodies really well. Mm-hmm. And so I understand on a biomechanic level, why, you know, when we lift up through our left shoulder and like what it does to our spine and how it manipulates their spine. And like, I understand all of that really well, but there are certain things that happen when you ride too, that while it is helpful to have a correct biomechanics, biomechanics is not actually what's doing it. Yeah. You know? So then we kind of opened up this discussion about that. So I'm like, so if you can alter a horse and get them to push through their limitations by altering how you're walking with them on the ground, like Mm -hmm. how much further does this get on the saddle? Like when we're breathing and when we're doing movements and how we're doing things. And then I would check and again, then, you know, I went back in my memory bank and I was like, okay, so when you get on a horse, like what it, what it comes down to is I have a really long checklist that's in my head that I go through when I'm anytime I swing up on a horse. Yeah. So I get on and I'm like, the first thing that I check in with is my breath. And I make sure that I'm not holding my breath because the moment I hold onto my breath, then I become scared. Right. Or at least in the, in their term, you know, I might not feel like I'm afraid, but I'm at least not breathing, which makes me like more in that prey predator response. And so that immediately transfers over to the horses. The first thing that I do is I breathe Mm -hmm. and then I check in with my own body and every time, and this is where it got kind of trippy for me is it was always my goal to have the horses as relaxed as possible. Mm -hmm. And so when I get on a horse and I check in and I breathe, if we're moving around, I always would try to like move my body as much as I would want the horse to move their body. I never, I never rode stiff. I'm not a, like a pretty equitation rider. I mean, I can be like, I can go into a show ring and I can kind of pull my stuff together. But when I'm like actually riding and schooling, it's not, it's I'm not straight 
You know, I'm yeah. not just writing that stick straight shoulders back. I'm just going to write a straight line. Like if I'm writing and I'm setting up for a curve, my whole rib cage like comes under and it moves. And I, what I realized was that I do in my body, what I want the horse to do before I ask the horse to do it. Yeah. And that is, what the mirror neurons are really all about for as a writer, because it's like, okay, so if you are breathing, they're going to want to breathe back to you. And if you're setting yourself up for the movement that, that they want them to do. And again, it's not all biomechanics because the horse just feels what you're doing and they come back and they try to, mm-hmm. they try to mimic that to stay with you. And it's just, it's just bananas. It's so cool. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like because you're so intentional about how you're what your body language is doing your intention is so strong that the horses can't not feel that yeah big time yeah and there is I've never taken an animal communication class which is that kind of on my list of things to do because people ask me all the time they're like so so you're an animal communicator and I'm like well it's like in on one level yeah totally 100 percent. but I couldn't tell you like what their favorite color is or their favorite toy or that thing that you did five years ago that really made them mad like no idea (laughs) Yeah. Um, but I can tell you generally like what they struggle with, how long they've been struggling, what makes things easier for them, what they're trying to say. I can tell you when they're confused and I can yeah. tell you, you know, if they're, I, I can be, I really like to translate basically between what's going on with the horse to the rider. Like I'm a very big communicator yeah. that way. Yeah. I hesitate in saying that I'm an animal communicator because I'm not in the same realm as other humans that do it. But yeah, I know it's, it's really true and it is being very intentional, but another thing that's really big too, is again with that. And, and it sounds like you're completely into this kind of like more, more on the energetic scale too, but yeah. you really can send images to them. So like every time I'm getting ready to do something with them, I kind of send them an image where I'm like, all right, so like, this is what we're going to do. And this is kind of what it's going to look like. And I almost have, you know, it's the same thing. You have a horse that's struggling with a lead because he's had a really severe physical mm-hmm. holding for a while. And he has got maybe some PTSD about moving through it. You can sit there and be like, cool, this is, you know, what it's going to look like in my head and just make that a little bit easier for them to see what's going on coming up. And so everything really is intention. Yeah. Um, And horses are, I mean, they're the masters of reading energy and body language. Like that's just period. So the best thing that we can do to communicate with them is also do our best to kind of master our own. And then it just makes it that much easier. Yeah, and I think it's really helpful for people as well that sometimes uh, you hear other people who are more into this, they'd be like, oh, you just have to be super present. And it's like, well, it's like when you say someone, like you tell someone to meditate and they try and they're like, well, this is freaking hard. I can't just sit here for ages. Whereas (laughs) if you actually have a physical task that you can focus on, like, okay, I want you to actually mirror what your horse's body is doing. I want you to be very intentional and think ahead about what you want to do. Then that gives the person a task that they can solidly focus on. And then their intention is cleared up and they automatically have to be present because, there's you can't think about anything else while you're doing that if you're doing it properly yeah no nope, 100 yeah. percent. yeah super cool okay so um you okay so basically just to recap what you've said there um in regards to transitioning from the horse side of things to the human side of things and making them blend together is really going okay you need to make sure that you're very intentional with your body language and almost use your body as a tool to be able to tell your horse what you would like them to do or show them what you would like them to do via manipulating your own body and also using your thoughts and your intention and things like that very, uh, um, I don't know, very precisely, I don't know the right word, um, in a way to kind of like help the horse understand what you're doing and really making sure that you're checking in with your own breath and making sure that you're not holding any tension in your body that the horse is potentially Mm -hmm. going to pick up on and copy. Um, Mm -hmm. So in saying that, um, that's what you do. How do you help people do that themselves? Because I know that you've got a range of different modalities to help people. You've got the human body work, horse body work, uh, human biomechanics work, human trauma work, how do you kind of tie it all together? And I'm sure it's different for everyone, but just to give people a kind of nutshell view of if if they are someone that would like to clear up their communication with their horse or they feel like their horse is sound and good, like maybe your horses were, um, but they just feel like something's a bit off, what would you say to someone like that? 
Well, I mean, the first thing is that they're probably not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, trusting your intuition is, is everything really in this. If I had a dollar for every single time I had an owner that was like, you know, I just really knew that there was something wrong and everybody told me that there wasn't, you know, people that have spent just thousands and thousands of dollars on vet diagnostics only mm-hmm. to come up with just nothing. And, you know, and then I go in and I find a pinched nerve or, you know, there's something that's going on that I can help unwind it. And they're just like, I always knew something is wrong. And I just feel crazy. Like yeah. there's the horse industry. I mean, and I know every industry is like this, but the horse industry, and this is probably one of my biggest frustrations that I run into, um, which I realize isn't a question that you've asked, but I think it ties into this is that mm-hmm. it, it's a very, it's a culture that involves a lot of gaslighting yeah, um, and a lot of control. And so you have a lot of trainers that really enjoy, frankly, taking money from people and they kind of have like that, you know, you're not safe and you don't know anything. And like, they really, they really almost prey on the uneducated. Yeah. They take the power away from the person. They do completely, you know, and they do it in the name of like being a quote unquote professional and be that as it may you know, most owners develop a really beautiful close relationship with their horses. And so even though they might not have the education that the trainer has or that the vet has, um, that doesn't mean that they're not hearing what's going on with the horse completely. And so many times, like so many times I'll have owners that I meet and they're like, for three years, I have been telling somebody that something is wrong with my horse. And for three years, everybody has told me that I was too crazy and too uneducated and that I just need to keep my mouth shut. And yeah. it just breaks my heart because I've, they've never been wrong. Like yeah. every time I come across them, there's always something. So it's like my biggest thing for telling people things like that is to number one would be to trust your intuition always. You know, if you Mm-hmm. If you think something is wrong and your horse is telling you something is wrong, like you're the one that has the relationship with the horse better than anybody, you're like education aside, you're probably not wrong. So yeah. don't be afraid to ask different opinions. Like go ask other people, you know, if I can't find an answer to something, like I am the queen of working well with other people. I have so many other people in my toolbox that I refer out to yeah. that if I can't figure something out, I'm like, Hey, let me call this colleague or let me check in with this person or you know, let's do some research on it. Like there's, I've never once been like, yep, nope, sorry. You're just wrong. Like it's yeah. not in my vocabulary. Can't do it. Yeah. Um, as far as what all of my different modalities can do to help people. So, and again, looking back, like when I started doing all these different things, I never, I guess I always kind of knew and hoped that they would mixed together the way that they mm-hmm. do now, but they certainly didn't seem like it at the time. And I actually used to get quite a bit of flack from people for being interested in so many different things. They're like, well, you just need to pick one. And I'm like, I did pick one. It's, it's the horses. Like I picked the horses. I'm just trying yeah. to kind of, you know, have more things that I can support them. But I suppose one example is I gave a lesson not too long ago. Um, and the girl had a horse They've been working together. They were a team for a, quite a while and they do jumpers, but he really had developed this really, I don't want to say it's like a terrible behavior. He's just, he's really spooky. Okay. okay. So she was just like, I'm terrified of him. He's big off track thoroughbred. She's like, every time I ride him, you know, it's just really hard and scary. And I feel like maybe there's something going on with him. Like, I just want to double check that he's not in too much pain because at this point, you know, we're basically just going to send him off to a cowboy because he just needs to stop this behavior. Mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, you know, we'll see what we can do. And so I had her meet me out for a lesson. And in all of my lessons, I always check the horses over physically first. So that usually comes with a little body session anyway. And so she met me and we pulled the tack and I worked him over. And sure enough, he had a lot of the the thoracic sling issues that I find most commonly in horses. Um, And so I had some pinched nerve and he did, wasn't able to move freely throughout his neck. And, you know, there's a whole long list of things that I can get into, but basically his body had really locked up and especially through his rib cage. And so, you know, same thing for us when the horse's rib cages get locked up, they can't breathe mm. correctly. And they're basically stuck in like this almost pseudo hyperventilation state. And riders are very obviously or very often like that too. And so I do a lot of diaphragm release work on my human patients. So it's like, I get them to open up their diaphragm and all of a sudden they can breathe better. And, you know, it's, it's really hard to teach somebody to do something that their bodies are not physically capable of doing. 
Yeah. And so that's basically where my work is. And so, you know, I did some breath work exercises with her before I had her get on the horse that kind of helped move her diaphragm and her rib cage a little bit. It wasn't as good as a manual release, but it did give her something to play with. And so she sat down and I was having her do the breath work while I was working on the horse and I got the horse physically alleviated as much as I could. And then I took him through, I do a lot of in-hand work after I work with them just to get them to kind of re-remember that their bodies can move in a more free way. Because if you just release the horse and you put him back in a stall, they're yeah. just going to kind of seize back up again, you know, cause they don't know. Yeah. And so I moved him through these range of motions and I got him breathing and he was like, you could just tell that he was just like, oh my gosh, this feels so much better. This is really cool. I'm like, awesome. All right. So horse is feeling better. The rider's feeling better. Now let's go ahead and get on and I'll, you know, we'll take him through. And we specifically met it in, a, in, in an arena that he really has a lot of issues in. Uh -huh. And so we're going along and all of a sudden he would like freak out and spook and stop and spin. And she, and she's, and she's a good rider. She stuck it really well. And she wasn't beating him or anything. She just pet him and like kept going. And she's like, this is kind of what I'm talking about. Like, he's just, I feel like I don't have any control. He is scared out of nowhere. Like, I don't know what to do about it. And I'm like, okay, let's go the other way. And so he was only spooky going to the right, to the left. He wasn't spooky at all. Mm. And a really cool point to this is that they are prey animals right? Mm -hmm. They are, they do everything in their power to hide their vulnerabilities, which what is what makes good body work so hard because it is not easy to find unless yeah. you're really, really, really trained eye what you're looking for, because they do everything within their power to not flinch out of pain. Mm -hmm. The amount of horses that come in that I work on that are not in any quote unquote pain is like just unprecedented. So when they have more vulnerabilities on one particular side, that is the side that they will always be spooky on, which is mm -hmm. crazy because I remember vividly growing up being like, my horse is like, just sees monsters out of his right eye. Yeah. Like, I don't know if you've ever had one of those horses, but I had a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 And so it's like, yeah, no, going this way. They just, they, it's stuff scarier that way. It just always is, you know, their vision's different or, you know, we, we hear all these different theories. Well, the actual, <laughs> the actual thing is that they probably had a holding on that side that was way more significant than the other side. And they knew that, you know, if they're in the wild and they have a lot of weaknesses on the right side, if they get attacked on the right side, they're done. Yeah. They and so themselves. they have to protect themselves. And that's, that's what it comes down to with them. And so we're mm -hmm. like, all right, so here's the deal. You know, he is more vulnerable going this direction than that. And because of these findings that we had, so we're going to go his other way first, we're going to teach him to find balance and breath and get him to kind of calm down going that way. And then we'll, you know, we'll, go back the other way and have that conversation later. So yeah. we started his more strong side. So he could kind of build some self-confidence and while they're riding around, I asked the rider, I said, how many seconds is it taking you to breathe in and out? Like, go ahead and give me a couple numbers. And she kind of checked in with her breath and she's like, oh, about two seconds in and out. Well, oh, good. So we're like almost hyperventilating. <laughs> so, okay. so while you're walking, just, just walk for a minute. I said, I want you to try to stop like fidgeting with him. Like, I, I know that you're worried that he's going to spook, but I need you to just trust that this direction he's probably not going to. And I just want you to try to get your breath. Like, just try to even get it to four seconds, like four in, four out and see what you can do and then see what you can move up to from there. And she ended up getting in like four or five seconds in six seconds out. So really nice, good deep breaths. And within a half a circle of her actually breathing, the horse started breathing. Yeah. And then he relaxed into his body. And I told her, I said, so, and then it goes back to those mirror things. I said, historically, this is a very confident rider. She's not scared. She doesn't typically get on yeah. a horse and get scared. Um, I said, but you have a history with him mm -hmm. where you get on him and he does these crazy antics and it's really scary and you're anticipating it. So the problem is, is that even when he's not doing it, you're still anticipating that he's going to do it. So you're stuck in this like negative feedback loop. For sure. You can't get out of it. Yeah. So, you know, the thing with horses and I, I say this and, it, you know, I mean, it kind of comes out as a joke, but it, I'm actually quite serious about it is that it, you really have to master being bipolar. Like you have to be completely okay being on one end of the spectrum. And the moment, the very moment they even have a positive thought in a different direction, you have to come back to the other and you cannot hold a grudge. You cannot be anticipating that they're going to do it. Like, and this is the difference between the amateur writer and the professional writer as a professional, it is our job to not hold a grudge, right? Yeah. Like 
you are no longer spooking. You are no longer doing these things. Like I am not going to be on this level of the spectrum anymore. I'm going to come right back down to this one. And so as a, when we're trying to lead them through these things, I said, I know, you know, and I mean, and some writers aren't able to do this because they have a history with a horse and that's okay. Like that's totally okay. Send the horse to somebody else. Like don't, you know, you don't need to have an ego about it. But in this particular case, I told her, I said, if you can, if you can feel safe enough in your body that you can check in with your breath first and you kind of lead the way and get him to check in with his breath, it's going to feel so much better for both of you, for him to be able to relax and do a skin and to kind of come back to center because the other thing that gets really hard with them is that when they are feeling vulnerable, they literally check out of their body. They're not present. So yeah. then you're like riding around on this, you know, 1200 pound beast yeah. that's not actually in his body. He's like checked out after projecting to some party outside of the arena. Yeah. And, you know, you're like, I don't, we don't want to go to that party. Like we want him to come back to this party, but this needs to be a safe party for him to come back to. So we started making it safe by fixing his body issues or at least alleviating a lot of them. And now we have to have it safe with you on his back while you're breathing and you're checking in. So mm. she breathes, she checked in, he did the same thing. And then I asked her to check into her body. And I said, where are you feeling any tensions anywhere in your body? Not in his, but in your body. She's like, well, she said, my right hip keeps seizing up randomly. And I said, okay. I said, do you historically have a problem with your right hip? She said, no. And I said, okay, well, so he does. And um, that was one of the uh-huh. things that I found on him. I said, so when you feel that ping, I want you to, especially because it's not actually yours that you're feeling. So it's not like her right hip is stuck. She's just feeling his. I said, so when you feel that, I want you to kind of take a moment and like clue into that. And I want you to try to just consciously relax that side of your body. Yeah. And she would do that. And then all of a sudden, the because t- the, the horse's tail was switching at the time. And so she really clued in and relaxed it and relaxed it and relaxed it. And about a circle into that, the horse did another deep breath. And then he started licking and chewing and his tail swished. And I'm like, ah, there's the mirror neurons, right? Like, He's Mm -hmm. picking up that she's actively relaxing this one particular thing that's really hurting with him. And again, like it's not going to fix the lameness issue, but it is going to signal to the horse to relax and move. It's more of like a societal pressure than a physical one. Uh And so we just did a lot of little things like that. And, you know, at one point she, she just started kind of crying a little and was just releasing. She's like, you know, I, I didn't think that I could even get this far with him because they were just walking calmly. And I was like, well, we still got to go the other way. (laughs) So, Uh you know, that's, this is part of the thing is, you know, is getting out of that negative feedback loop. And so, you know, that ended up being like a little bit of a trauma release for both of them. And they're, you know, he's looking and chewing and she's tearing up and they're both feeling relaxed. And I'm like, okay, so I want you to try to memorize this feeling um, before we go to the other side. And then I, I added in, I threw in, I do a lot of balance through movement work. And so I, teach the horses or teach the riders to do different things with the horses that help the horse find balance before Mm -hmm. finding anything else. And so to me, that's like a big, probably the number one thing that I teach in terms of like training wise. And so I said, part of his thing too. So he's in pain. He's anticipating that he's going to be attacked by an imaginary monster. Mm -hmm. His person is holding her breath. So she's re confirming essentially that you are in fact, probably going to die. And then, um, and then on top of it, he's just, he falls off balance. And so when he falls off balance, even if it's a small, subtle thing, then he really spirals into down the rabbit trail because he's like, ah, I'm off balance. I'm going to lose the kid. I'm going to lose myself. Like we're all going to die. I'm going to fall. And yes, that's, that's how we get eaten, you know? And you can just hear this like trail that's going through this poor horse's brain. So I'm like, we're just going to go step by step and fix all these things. So we got all the way to the end. We showed him how to fix his balance. And so she felt really confident about getting him upright and balanced and moving. I'm like, all right, sweet. So we're going to take all of this and we're going to go the other way. We're going to go the scary way. And I said, we're going to do the same thing all over again. We're going to start with the steps. We're going to do the breath. We're going to check in your body. We're going to do the things. So, you know, basically she ended up having her own checklist of what it is that she's going through. And he started to spook. He didn't ever do his big extreme thing, but he started to spook once. And she physically just really did a nice like meditation, HA exhale, right? And she exhaled and asked him to yield out to find his balance. And the moment he did that and she breathed, he put his head down and breathed and kept going and was totally fine and didn't spook. 
And then she just kind of kept checking into that. And she did that. And they did walk track counter both ways. And he was completely fine. And he didn't check out of his body and go to the imaginary party anymore. Mm. And she got done and she got off. And she's like, I have clinics with so many people. And everybody has just told me to like, push him through this or, you know, there's more of this, more of that. And there's always, you know, it's the push culture that is the equestrian culture. That's just, there's more push, more force, more force. Yeah. We'll get him through it. And she's like, never in a million years that I think that I was going to sit here. And it was like a two hour lesson. She's like, never in a million years. That I think I was going to sit here for two hours and breathe and do this just so minimal, such subtle work and that the horse could just come back, you know? And then she ended up kind of talking about some personal things in her life that it resonated with. And, and that's where all of it kind of ties in because it's like, you know, we, we come to the ring with things that we are going on in life. You know, I've had clients that would get on a horse and, you know, I didn't know that they were going through a divorce, but man, their horse did, you know, and, you know, being able to sit with somebody and hold space for them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you don't have to be a therapist to hold space for somebody. You can just really sit there and allow them to process through things and allow them to talk about things and allow them to release it so that they're not bringing it to the horse. Yeah. And you're getting to allow the horse to bring that up for them because they are so honest about everything. And so learning to read between the lines and being like, Hey, you're not actually here for a 50 minute lesson. Like you're here to, Mm. that's the other thing. I don't, I don't ever work on time schedules. That's the other thing that makes me really weird. Um, I try if I have a barn like back to back, but I mean, everybody that works with me knows that I will probably be late. Yeah. And it's because I absolutely refuse to ever work on a time schedule. Like we go until basically the horse says that they're good. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just really, it's, it's just cool. (laughs) It's so interesting hearing you explain sort of that process with that particular client, because it's so, like the work that I do with my clients, I do it in a different way, but it's essentially achieving like such similar things. And you can just see like, it's just so cool how there's lots of different people out there now that are doing the same kind of work, but in different ways and that appeals to different kinds of people. So for example, um, I work with um, helping people basically learn how to do like the core horsemanship principles to either help their horses feel more confident or themselves feel more confident or both. Um, And generally I start with getting them to learn how the horses learn, going through some groundwork, then transitioning that to desensitizing on the ground, desensitizing on the saddle, and then kind of tying it all together so that they can go out to different environments. And what I really find is a lot of the desensitizing stuff Yeah, it's great for the horses to teach them to relax around different things. But a lot of the times it's to teach the human that the horse isn't going to freak out at things. And it's to teach the human when you do it under saddle to breathe because so many times you'll be waving a flag and the person automatically assumes that because their horse is quote unquote spooky or was spooky that they're going to do something. And then they're like, holy shit, I'm tense and my horse is tense. Okay, I'm going to breathe and calm down. And that makes the world of difference. And I also do um, some breakthrough sessions myself using neurolinguistic programming. And just through those sessions alone, getting them to release trauma that they've held on to from their childhood, it allows yes. them to, like, the horse spooks and then they laugh instead of freaking out because they're holding on to all this anger and stuff. Like, that is gone so they yes. can just literally relax. It's so It's so intertwined and, like, I just think it's cool the way you described what you do because it's the same but different and yeah I just think it's also cool it's so cool and I love I do love so much that it seems like more and more people are getting at least aware and that's when I say mindful horsemanship this is what I mean by it yeah is it's just like it's becoming a thing that more and more people are actually being aware of and it's like they're waking up to the idea that we could do better by them and I'm like yes (laughs) I know and it's so cool like horses are such powerful motivators because so many people like this this kind of work changes not only their relationship with their horses like but their whole lives and the relationships with everybody and themselves as well but it's like without the horses they probably wouldn't go through all of it but the horse is such a beautiful kind of like mirror for them to be like hey you need to look at this stuff like for me (laughs) yeah and they're like oh thank you I did it (laughs) yeah well the same thing for the you know I mean and on on the baseline schedule that was the only reason funny story the only reason why I went to horse or human massage school Mm. 
mm. was because I kept finding um, the horses just kept having these like the same issues over and over again that I would work on them. And I was like, what is going on? And then somebody was like, oh, or I, I would be talking to the person. I'm like, yeah, you know, I just keep finding this thing. And it's really interesting. Like what's going on? Like, how are you riding them? And I was trying to, I always try to find out why I'm yeah. a big, I'm yeah. constantly solving for why it's my blessing and a curse, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but um, I'm sure. I drove my parents now. <laughs> I would ask questions with the owners. I'm like, Hey, I'm finding laughing and they're like oh that's really funny because that's my problem and that's what I'm struggling with and I'm like that's curious and so I had this thought in my head that if I went back to school and I learned how to work on humans that I could work on humans release what was going on in their bodies the riders and then they would stop messing up the horses that I was working on necessarily but it's not things that we're protecting against and so the way that the horse's body works like we're not supporting it always the best way that we could be and so that's the second piece that you find in horses. So they're either struggling from holdings that they're picking up from their riders or they're struggling from um, chronic symptoms of imbalances. And so I've just basically been trying to piece all those things together and be like, how can we fix it? How can I basically train myself out of a job? Because if I can get us to not do these things to the horses, then you know I won't have any horses to work on, right? Which is it's not actually going to happen. But um, <laughs> I've never... I'm the opposite of most body workers that I know, at least in this there, you know, I mean, it's really good job security, right? When the horses keep getting messed up, because when we go out there, I used to get, there was a barn that I worked at for a long time and man, I'd work on their horses every two weeks and it was really good money. Um, but I ended up getting frustrated because I was like, why do they need this every two weeks? Like, what are we doing? And, yeah. and then it wasn't, and, and I don't do like the fluff buff massage. I do structural integration for both. So it's like, it's pretty intense. Like I do, I am basically realigning and reprogramming the fascia and I'm unpinching nerves and I'm doing ligament releases. Like it's pretty in-depth work. Mm. And I'm like, the horses shouldn't need this amount of work every two weeks if we're working them correctly. And so yeah. trying to, again, it's like, it's not like I don't like making the money, but I shouldn't, I sh it shouldn't be this way. I and so agree. I've, yeah, yeah. So I've been, like I said, probably like the last two years, especially, especially, and this year has been really fun because it's really taken off. So anymore, I don't actually just do body work anymore. Um, so if you have a session with me, what you get is I come out and I body map your horse and I show you, basically, I kind of give you a rundown and I know it takes like years to develop it, but at least gives you like a basic principle of what to look for and what I find on the horse and what that means in terms of lack of balance and lack of strength in other areas. And then I work on them and then I put them through in hand movements. And then I teach you how to do those in hand movements. And then I put you in the saddle and then we do a little mini lesson with basically whatever PT exercises that particular horse needs to reprogram the fascia so that it holds everything that I just worked on. Yeah. So that makes me feel a lot better. And the results have been really, really, really awesome that way. Um, and then, it, you know, honestly, it just puts the power back into the owner and the trainer too, because it's like, you shouldn't be relying on me to keep your horse sound. Completely. And also people can't expect you to just fix their horse in one session. Like they actually need to do some follow-up things too, because the horse has learned to move in a certain way. Like it's going to take some mm -hmm. time for them to kind of relearn to move in the new way. Like, Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, very cool. Great time. Um, there was a section where you were chatting. Just, I just want to recap it because my internet just dropped out really briefly. But just to recap, so you're basically saying in regards to you noticed with the horses how they were like the problems would pop up, and then you realized that the problem was popping up in the human, and then you transitioned to learning. Well, not transition. You started learning a bit more about the body work with the humans, so that you could kind of pair them together um to really kind of like tick both pieces off because you realized they were kind of mirroring each other so I just wanted to recap there I'm pretty sure that's what you said um yeah. just in case there's a blank in the audio that that that's what it means <laughs> yep yep that was it perfect cool um all right well I know that we've been going for a little bit over time, um, I think, and but I feel like we've just kind of gotten into the juice of things, but that's okay. <laughs> Is there anything else before I dive into a couple of questions that you want to touch on in regards to like cool findings that you've seen with horses or, um, yeah. 
Um, I would say probably my two biggest things, findings body-wise of horses that I work on the most is the first one would be the thoracic sling. Uh So anything that is, it's basically, you know, like their withers to their sternum, their shoulders, and then basically, I mean, I, I include the whole neck into it, but it's basically just the base of the neck. One of the very common things that happen is they, the scapula get, is a floating, right? And so it's kind of like held together by all the connective tissue. And what happens is they get so tight in the way that they turn just, and it's just like super subtle moments. Like it's just ever so slightly too much weight to that inside foreleg. And over time it gets so tight that the scapula actually folds down on top of the, it's called the brachial plexus, but it's on top of the base of the lower cervical spine. And so it ends up hitting some pinched nerves in there. Hmm. And it can develop in so many different ways, like so many ways. I've had horses that have been diagnosed with wobbler syndrome because the nerve fire shooting down their legs is so bad that their knees buckle. Hmm. Um, Sometimes it's just plainly undiagnosed lameness in the front end. You know, people have done all the imaging, all the ultrasounds, and it's just they can't find anything, but it's the lameness is caused from the nerve fire or it can go up their neck. And so they have really chronic sensitivities th- through their neck. They can't bend adequately at all. Physically, they really can't. Sometimes people think that their horses are really head shy and that's actually causing, it's from the nerve fire. It's not actually because they're head shy. Mm. Um, being senshi is another symptom of it. Having pain up in the withers. It's just, it's pretty wild how much the span of just that one spot can do it. And so getting, finding people that can really, understand how the thoracic sling works and how to alleviate the nerves and then how to rebalance the body to support that is going to be really a game changer. I think for everybody, I would venture to say that 90% of all the horses that I work on have some kind of a problem in their thoracic sling. Uh Um, On a low grade scale, what it does too is it shuts down, it minimizes their ability to actually move out freely through their shoulder. And so it ends up having a shortening of their stride in the front and some people don't even know that because you don't even know how big your horse can trot really if you, you know, mm-hmm. if it was open. So what happens is that when the front end shuts down, the hind end can only go as far as the front end will allow. Mm. And so then they start doing this weird, like basically compromise movement in their hind end to shorten up their hind movement so that they don't overreach the front. And so they're actually moving their whole body in a compromised manner that they would not typically be able to, or that they would not normally be doing had they not had an issue in that thoracic sling. Mm -hmm. And what you run into there is that then you run into really chronic low back pain and hamstring issues Yeah, because they're like arched up because they can't move freely and forward. And then you have low back pain and then you have bucking issues. You have lead change issues. You have just overall behavior issues at a mare that came in for training slash rehab who basically was a throwaway. The trainers were like, there's nothing we can do. She's just a dud, really well-bred $60,000 jumper horse. And they're like, yep, nope. She's just not, you know, her stallion's super famous, but this mare is just a dud. Like she hates her job. She's never going to do anything, blah, blah, blah. And she just had, that's all she had going on. It took four months to release her body and to rehab her through the movement. And she's going to compete in derbies this year. I mean, she's like incredible. And all of her bucking issues, all of her cross firing issues, all of her behavior issues, it was all just from that. So that's, that's like the number one thing I think that I find and that I work on. Um, And it's just something to be really cognizant of. Hmm? So if people wanted to kind of get their horse look like checked out with that kind of thing, is there anything that people can do themselves to kind of tap into that? Or do you need to find a specific practitioner that works in that area and that like is really like can understand that? Because I'm just thinking it sounds like in your situation that you're someone who's really managed to kind of um, master that area. And like you're saying, a lot of of people overlook it. So yeah. How can people kind of work out? Does my horse have that problem? Like that kind of thing. I am actually, it's really funny that you asked me that. Um, this whole last weekend, I've been talking to some people because I can't actually find anything Mm -hmm. on it, which is wild to me. Like, like there's a body workers that know about it, but not to like the extent that I'm talking about. And so what we're going to try to figure out is how to make a video, like an owner's video, essentially, so that I can kind of show you some basic things that you can go through and actually check and see. It's not something like, I mean, you can kind of like 
this isn't, this might not even make sense, but you can basically put your finger in the base of their neck as it goes into their shoulder on the bottom side and kind of like really put in pressure and almost like flick your finger towards yourself. And if they react to that, or if that area is super tight, then they probably have a sling thing going on. Or if it's basically anything other than just jello and loose, they have a thor- thoracic sling issue going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, no, I think I'm just, I'm trying to figure out the best way to just do videos on it because I don't, I can't find anything on it. It's just crazy. Yeah. That's what I was just thinking because it's like, I was just thinking if someone's listening and they're like, oh, great, cool. Well, I'm in Australia or Europe or wherever they're right. from. It's like, oh, well, great. Now I'll just sit here and do nothing. Nah. <laughs> so well, yeah. You know, yep. Yes, Keep me posted. Um, so you will be the first to know when I have a video, I will send you one. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Amazing. Um, okay, cool. Okay. Um, is there anything else you want to add in regards to findings and all of that before we kind of wrap up and I just give you my last few questions? I, I mean, I think that would be the basic one to look into. And then always my top things that I always ask is, you know, we ask a little bit about nutrition, make sure their feet are good, yeah. make sure their teeth have been looked at and ulcers you know those are your top of your checklist amazing cool perfect all right and um so one of my questions that i like to ask everyone is what advice would you give to your younger self oh to not put people on pedestals Mm. (laughs) yeah um the amount of times that i've been disappointed by my heroes is many Mm. um because we are all just human you know, and there's always kind of something, but to try to not put too many people on pedestals and to, and this isn't just to my younger self, this is literally to anybody, but to always, always, always trust your gut and trust your horse. Yep. Always. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those, those two things have never been wrong in my life. And I would venture to say that any detours, I don't necessarily believe in wrong choices, but any detours that I've made that have been probably less than what I would have liked came from purely me not trusting one of those two things. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And who inspires you at the moment? Oh my goodness. There's so many people. Um, (laughs) Genuinely the people that inspire me are, it's not even like set names. It's just really anybody that's just going for it. Like just, you know, and I see it a lot, especially like in the younger community right now is, you know, we get these kids and they're just, man, they're just going for it. Like they have this idea and they have this passion inside of them that they're just burning for it. And they're just doing everything that they can. And that, that always inspires the hell out of me because, you know, you get tired and you get run down and you're like, man, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. And then you see somebody that just has that fire lit. Yeah. And so those guys always refuel my fire, but people like Catherine Calkins and Tara Davis and the people that are really trying hard, you know, you, um, people that are just really trying hard to be the advocate for the horses and, you know, doing better, the more they learn better, like that too. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And lastly, what is your equestrian perspective or a message that you would like to share? I think if I had to put it all together would be and I guess this kind of ties into another finding too that I've found, but it's really become kind of my core message is that, you know, very rarely do we see horses that have behavior issues that are actually behavioral. Um, Mm -hmm. And I know that that's a pretty common and it sounds like a hallmarky thing to say, but it is really true. Um, There's no such thing as a heavy horse, even that like, you know, you have horses that are like super heavy in your hands and people are like, Oh my God, they're just this and they're that they're really not. It's always a symptom of imbalance. Almost everything that I see in a horse is a symptom of imbalance. Yeah. And so understanding that if we trained for, I guess, first, first and foremost would be if we train for understanding and then followed up by training for balance, making sure, you know, that's, that's the actual foundation for everything. Is your horse balanced or do they feel safe in their body? Do they feel safe in their body to carry you? And then if all of that is lined up and that is correct, then the next piece would be training for fitness for the movement that you're trying to do, not actually training for the movement itself. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's a really tricky one too. You know, it's like in this community, you know, we train so hard, you know, you'll have like a dressage test and man, people are out there just doing the dressage test over and over and over again, trying to memorize it. But it's like, 
you know, maybe the horse might not even be shaped to be cantering a full 20 meter circle, actually balanced, you know, maybe yeah. they can only canter a few strides and we haven't let them fall out and we haven't taught them to honor their body. And it's like, there's so many different things and you find so many really chronic lameness issues, you know, things with their, whether it's bow tendons or it's collateral ligament stuff or suspensory injuries. Mm so many of those that we have found have always traced back to the fact that the horse is holding because they're pushing through discomfort or a lack of fitness and balance. And then they're putting their body into a compromised state. And then it's blowing out one of these things. Yeah. Like that's, that is always the, the checklist that it goes down and, you know, unless it's like a freak accident in a pasture or something, but for the most part, it always comes down to that. So my message would be to just always check in, you know, make sure that your horse understands what it is you're doing. Mm Mm-hmm help them in any way, shape or form to constantly always find balance within themselves. Not that you're, you know, you're holding them together, but that the horse can hold themselves together on their own because they know what they're doing and then just train for fitness. And if you do that, dude, like you'll be able to do every discipline, every movement, it won't matter. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. Um, yeah, I could go on a tangent, but I know that we've been going for longer and I think this is a good place to kind of wrap up. Um, but, yeah, thank you so, so, so much for joining me today. I've really enjoyed chatting with you and, yeah, I think we're very much on a similar wavelength even though we're kind of diving into kind of different areas. But, yeah, I just think it's super cool the work that you're doing and that you are you are mixing all of these modalities together because, really it, it you have to have a holistic approach in order to treat you can't just treat one thing with one modality anymore i just don't think like 2021 like we're, we're right. here to do things differently we're here now. <laughs> um, yes. so yeah i think that's super cool and um where can people find you um i'm on the facebooks and on instagram and then my website uh-huh i can put so all the got- links in the show notes as well okay awesome so you- perfect Cool. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Just super, super cool talking to you. And you're also always welcome to message me all of your soapboxes. I love hearing them. <laughs> oh, perfect. Excellent. <laughs> cool. All righty. Well, thank you. And yeah, thanks for jump- jumping on today. Awesome. Have a good one. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of the Equestrian Perspective podcast. If you really enjoy it, please hit subscribe on the podcast so you can stay up to date with every episode that gets released. And also, if you want to share it around, please do so. Tag me on social media at Felicity Davies with an underscore at the end. And if you have any recommendations for episodes or guests that you would like me to interview on the podcast, please let me know via social media or if you have any questions at all, I'm happy to chat and I'm here for you whenever you need. So thank you for listening and I will see you in the next episode. Bye.